Um, let's go Galatians 5, verse 1 through 15. If you have a Bible, please open it. It'll be up here on the screen. If you don't own a Bible, um, or at least own a Bible that's that you enjoy reading, please let us give you one. We, we buy Bibles for the explicit purpose of giving them away. And so if you don't have one that's not in, you know, Elizabethan English, please let us hand you one. We would really, uh, we would really love to do that for you. Uh, Galatians 5, chapter 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You were severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves, for you were called to freedom, brothers. You only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. God, your word is fixed. The scriptures say, your word is fixed, it is eternal, and not one word proceeds from your mouth that doesn't accomplish the explicit purpose for which it was spoken. And so, God, I pray that as we read your word, as we interact with your word, you would come and challenge us, you would come and change us. Holy Spirit, you promise that when the word is preached, you would come and open it up, you'd illuminate the scriptures to us. And so we come and we invite you here now, Holy Spirit, empower my words and open the ears, minds, and hearts of those who are about to hear the gospel. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, When I was preparing this sermon for you this week, uh, as I was reading this text, a story kind of was brought to mind by the story in this text, what Paul was saying. And and I can't quite remember if I saw it on Nightline 2020 or, you know, read it in the newspaper or something like that, but it goes something like this. There there was a man um, who robbed a bank. He was about 25 years old. And, uh, and so goes in, robs the bank, takes millions of dollars, proceeds out to his car, and leaves. And that's it. There's no, there's no, they don't catch him, they don't follow him, and so he gets away with it for, for quite a few hours. There's no high-speed chase. It, he literally walks in, takes a few million dollars, walks out, and moves on with life. And, uh, w- which is a fairly skilled bank robber, in my estimation. It has nothing to do with the story. So he, he goes in, and he takes it, and he, he comes out. And it turns out he was only caught because he failed to turn on his blinker at a right turn. The police pull him over. And bummer, right? Bad day. Like, you did the hard thing well. You forgot the little thing. Um, turn, on, turn on your blinker. And so he forgot to turn on his blinker. He was pulled over. And sure enough, uh, there was an APB out for him. Uh, they arrested him bring him in, throw the book at him. He is in jail for 25 years. Now, it turns out, in jail for 25 years, uh, he, he was a fairly decent fellow, other than that whole stealing thing. Um, and, and 25 years in jail did a pretty good job of teaching him, uh, hey, don't steal. It does not work out well for you. Um, it also taught him to obey traffic laws, interestingly enough. Um, and so he gets to the end of his sentence, and it's about his 50th birthday, and he is set free, and he walks out, And terror hits him. Because he has not up to this point been able to conceive of his life not in prison. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that you, at around the age of 24 to 26, were caught for a crime and were imprisoned for 25 years. After a while, you would lose all frame of reference for what it meant to be free. And so... Much of the story that I was reading had to do with his inability to live out his freedom. His, I mean, he, he, would, he ended up finding a job with a rather demanding boss who told him what to do. He couldn't live in a big space. He wanted to live in a small kind of confined space. It was literally as though he didn't know how to live in the freedom that he had been given. He knew what it was like to be free from jail, but not free to live. 
it's an interesting connection to me because today we see Paul making a transition. Now, last week we, we talked to you as we wrap up this uh, sermon series called Grace Wins, the Battle of the Book of Galatians. What we've been seeing uh, up to this point is what the gospel of grace frees us from. And it all culminated last week when we, when we saw that the gospel of grace freed us from all sorts of great things, Free, frees us from sin. Yay. I mean, we should stop just for a moment and say, that's some pretty good news right there. The gospel of grace, what, and when we say gospel, I realize that some of you have been going to church uh, your whole lives, but many of you are in this church for the first time really exploring the claims of Christianity. Here's what I mean when I say gospel. The gospel is the story, the good news that God, who is greater and better than we could ever imagine, looked on us, his broken, messed up kids, with compassion and not wrath. Sending his son, the perfect image of himself, in the likeness of human flesh, to live a perfect life, to die a death in our place for our sins, and then to rise again three days later, conquering Satan, sin, death, demons, and everything that stands against us. So that, by trusting in that good news, that story, that gospel, we might live to God just as Christ now lives to God. That's what I mean when I say gospel. Believing in that story, trusting in that narrative, identifying your story with that story frees you from all sorts of really awful things like sin. Now, I realize that sin is not a popular word to use these days. We, we instead would rather talk about like negative behaviors or things that don't lead to your human flourishing or whatever. But part of the, part of the, part of the good news is the recognition that there's bad news. The scriptures say that we are all... in dead in our trespasses and sins, that we are by, nature's, by nature sinners, violators of God's law, both in word and deed, both in what we do and what we fail to do. But here's the interesting thing. The gospel doesn't only free us from the penalty of what we've done. It frees us from sins committed to us. That's good news. The most um, common statistics say uh, that In the United States of America, a third of all women have been or will be at some point the victims of some kind of sexual abuse. Isn't it great news that the gospel not only frees you from what you've done wrong, but what's been done wrong to you? That's great news. The gospel frees you from all sorts of things. The gospel frees you from religion. We talked about that last week, how we're free from having to live uh, in accordance with our list or self-justify or live uh, in accordance with what the culture says is right or even what a religion says is right. The gospel frees us by giving us the free gift of life so that now we can live lives free to, as we will see today, love and obey God and love and serve each other. See, there's a difference between being free from something and then being free to do another thing. There's a difference between being let out of prison and then now knowing, oh, what do I do now? So the apostle comes with this, uh, comes with this thunderous statement. So thunderous, I thought I'd preach it twice because I got it last week, and I'm going to talk about it again this week. I know you love it when I do that. Um, <laughs> For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. This is a big, big, bold. You can underline it. You can highlight it. You can put parentheses around it, lots of arrows pointing to it, because this is a big, big point. This thing is like the cherry on top of the Bible verses that have come to the left of this thing, okay? This is, this, this is the big deal. It's almost as though Paul has said every Everything up to this point so that he might say this for freedom Christ has set you free so don't put your chains back on for freedom Christ has set you free so don't put the slavery thing back on you for freedom you've been let out of prison so why are you backing up to the wall again There's an interesting thing, and and to really see why Paul was writing this, we have to remember what was going on in the churches in Galatia. Paul was writing to the churches because some false teachers had come in and started adding and subtracting and putting asterisks next to the gospel, this good news, and saying, oh, yeah, 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 the Jesus thing, and uh, and, and circumcision. So the, the coffee conversation after worship, you know, when everyone was getting a refill and saying hi to everybody was, you know, oh, hey, welcome to Aletheia. Oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. Glad to be here. So you're a new follower of Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Hey, have you, uh, have you done the circumcision thing yet? I'm really glad that that is not a ministry team in our church, right? I mean, that's, that would be weird. Um, oh, let me introduce you to my friend the Moyle. No, 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 no. I'm really glad that, that Paul won the argument here because that would make ushering and membership Sunday awkward for all of us, if I'm honest, okay? Um, uh, But what he's saying here is that there were false teachers that were coming in and saying, hey, Jesus and, 
Oh, yeah, you definitely need Jesus. Plus, yeah, Jesus will love you as long as... And they started writing a little bit of extra stuff, and it was almost like they took the infinite closed canon of Scripture and then started writing Book 67, the Book of First Opinions. Some of you have that in your Bible. You base a lot of your theology on it, probably. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You have been set free from all sorts of things. And now you are set free to love and obey God and love and serve each other. So why the chains again? I have news for you. Just as false teachers came in to the churches in Galatia, do you know that someone will always come? Every time you want to take a step back from Jesus, every time you want to take a step back into prison, every time you want to take a step away, a backslide on your walk, there will always be someone to amen that move in your life. Oh, yeah, honey, you need to leave him. Yeah, you can do better than that. Yeah, you know, I know the Bible says this, but this is how I really feel. Every time you want to take a step back, I guarantee you, you'll be able to find two or three people that'll go, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And what it does is you step back into prison, and all of a sudden you see gates closing in front of you. And you, imagining who you would be free, I found yourself back in chains once again. He goes on to say, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is now obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, and you have fallen away from grace. That's a pretty... Big statement. Now, let me just asterisk here this whole idea of falling away from grace. What Paul is not talking about losing one's salvation or being able to be rescued by God and then as though God goes, Oh, gosh, where did I put Adam? Uh, did, no, oh, dropped him. No, that's not, that's not how our rescue works. Like when God rescues you, you are rescued. You don't have to wake up going, Am I still, is he? Yes, he's God. He doesn't forget things, okay? Bad idea number two. Just keep a list. Those are bad ideas. No, he, he, he won't drop you. That's not what this is talking about. What he's talking about is active daily trust. He's saying, okay, you started off well, and then this false teaching came in, and you began to believe it. This false teaching came in that you had been freed from. You, you're now free to love and obey God, and now you're putting yourself back in the chains that Christ has set you free from. What are you doing? Now, in that context, you know, it was, it was the accepting of circumcision vis-a-vis awkward coffee conversation, right? But now, today, it's, it's all sorts of things like, well, I know that God's word says this, but this is how I feel. It's, it's, it's coming back to your list. Oh, you Bostonians, you achievers, you doers of things with lots of letters after your names. Like God is in heaven going, wow, double PhD, Holy Spirit, check it out. (laughs) I know we're on this whole salvation by grace through faith thing, but if anybody's got it, it's that guy right there. Did you read his dissertation? No, because no one reads them. Okay, but it was really good. It was was really good. He worked hard on it. It's like a thousand and a half pages. You don't care either? No, I know. This is roughly how I think God thinks about, don't worry, I'm writing a lot too, so you're not the only guy, but... I often wonder, is anyone going to read this? And the answer is, no, no one will ever read it. (laughs) Congratulations, no one will ever read it. Um, He says, if you do this, you're now severed from Christ. If you begin to trust in your ability to make yourself right before God, to self-justify, to live that way again, then you are now no longer free to love and obey God. Now you have severed yourself from the grace on offer, and you've backed up into the prison that you have just been freed from. You've backed up into the prison that you've just been freed from. And then he makes this very interesting uh, declaration. He says, listen, if you decide that that's what you want to do, just so you know, you have to keep the whole law. Here's the deal. When you die, this is straight up Christian orthodoxy. You ready? This is going to be good. Pull out the big crayon for this one. This was good. If you, when you die, you will stand before God and the scriptures say it is appointed for men to die and then be judged. Okay. That's women too. That's not a sexist passage. All right. Everybody going to die and stand before God. That's how it's going to go. And you're going to stand before God and you're going to hand him one of two things, your very best efforts or the merits of Christ. You're going to stand before him and hand to him your record, or you're going to say, uh, well, my record is bad, but his record is good. 
This would be something akin to, okay, let's go back to our story about the, the thief. Okay, let's say he didn't get caught. And for 25 years, he, he lived to the age of 50 and uh, quite well, if we're honest, because, hey, he just stole millions of dollars and remembered to turn on his blinker. So he was fine. He lived fine. And then all of a sudden, 50th birthday, he gets a little crazy, breaks the speed limit, and sure enough, he gets pulled over. APB is still out on the sky because in this imaginary world, there's no statutes of limitations. You law students, don't, don't get ahead of me. But it, they see him and they go, ah, oh, that's the guy who stole the millions. And so they haul him before the judge. And here's what he says. Well, Your Honor, I don't think that I should be held accountable for stealing this money because if you notice, I've kept lots of other laws. I, I, I have a pretty good driving record, except for that one time over the speed, speed limit, and I, I paid taxes on the money that I stole. And, and even when I'm a pedestrian, I, unlike every Boston resident, don't cross when the thing says don't cross. <laughs> Drives me nuts. I almost got a new hood ornament the other day. It was a Harvard student. It was really bad. Okay, if it says don't cross, don't, don't, just don't cross, unless it's me walking, and then I'll cross. But don't cross. <laughs> don't cross. It's very dangerous to drive around here for walkers. Um, and it says, listen, but I've obeyed all the law. And the judge, what's the judge going to do? He's going to go, well, good for you, but you still broke this one. That's not how law works, you realize. No amount of obedience to the law makes this one instance of disobedience okay. I can have a very clean record, but if I murder one of you after the service today, and don't worry, I'm not. I'm feeling great today. It's fine. Um, But if I do that, guess what? My clean record before this event doesn't really matter. I'm now accountable to the law that I broke, and the punishment and the weight of the whole law is now upon me. This is why it's so important that Jesus isn't just a nice guy. For some of you who are in here exploring the claims of Christianity for really the first time, I'm so glad you're here. Because often the question that I'll get asked is something like this. Well, you know, I like Jesus. And who doesn't like Jesus? Nice guy. Gave us Christmas, Easter. Come on. That's a good guy. We like Jesus. He's a nice guy. He put out some good ideas. Why do we need him to be like Lord, Savior? Why do we have to make these maximum kinds of claims about him? One of the reasons among many is because he has to rescue me. I am not able and you are not able to keep all of the requirements of the law. So unless I am set free from those requirements, I am still under the weight and the condemnation of them. I am not free from the law and I am not free to love and obey God. I am under the weight of my own sin. Do you see that? And so part of the transaction that happens when we trust in the gospel and we trust in Jesus is we say, hey, I'm broken, and I need his perfection to count for me. I need what he did to count for me. I need that 2 Corinthians 5.21 trade-off, for God made him who knew no sin to become my sin so that in him I might become his righteousness. I need that great exchange to count for me. And if that's what's gone on, that is your record. Righteous. Righteous. You've been set free from the law, and now you are set free to love and obey God as you ought to. Ooh, I said the O word. Obey. Mufasa. Yuck. I don't like it. And some of you are going, see, I knew that. I knew he couldn't talk about grace for long before he started talking about, you know, the, the list of don'ts. So I'm glad we finally got around to it. It's not like that. Listen to what Paul says. He says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we, eager, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness. Do we do the hope of righteousness? No. We wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Whoa, 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 whoa. We just... Wait, Paul, hold on. Paul just did something here, and and you'd have to keep reading the book of Galatians a lot to see this. Paul just put two ideas right next door to one another that he's been taking four chapters to try and separate in our minds. Namely, the idea of faith, trust in what God has done, and work, effort, action. And for the last four chapters, he said, look, your actions don't merit the grace. You trust in the grace. And now, he's saying, and if you do, you change. Hear this. We are saved by faith alone. But saving faith is never alone. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Ever alone. He says, circumcision, uncircumcision, it doesn't count for anything. Okay, Paul, so what does count? Only faith working through love. 
faith works its way out. We just read a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Donnie preached a great sermon to us about the Spirit being poured out in our spirit. God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit being poured out into our hearts such that now we are His sons and daughters if we raise our hands and say, this Jesus is mine and I am His. If that's the case, we are His sons and daughters and now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And what the Apostle wants to say here is, if that's true, your life looks different. You don't for long get to say, I'm saved by grace through faith, and then go on doing whatever you want to do. Oh, yeah, I'm saved by grace. It's kind of like playing tag when you're a kid. You remember bass? Remember bass? Like, I got got bass. I can do whatever I want. You know, as long as your hand was on bass, you can run around, you can hit people, you can tag people. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just whatever. I'm on bass. I'm on bass. And it's fine. That's not what grace is. Okay, none, some of you didn't have childhoods, apparently. You grew up in a box, in a test tube or something, and you just popped out as graduate students. Well, okay, in, in, my, in my growing up, we had grass and yards, and we, we, we played tag. Um, and and if, you, if you call base, then you're good. That is not what grace does. That is not what grace does. What Paul wants to guard us against is these bad ideas. One of these bad ideas is the bad idea of legalism, which hopefully you've noticed for the last like three months, we've been beating the holy fire out of, okay? We hate the idea of legalism. We hate the idea that you can do something, and by your doing it, God's going to go, ooh, I like that guy, that guy. No, that's a stupid idea by virtue of who God is. And if you want an update on that, that's why we have a podcast. But today, we also want to go to the other side to say, grace does not therefore untether you to go do whatever hell you choose for yourself. That is not what grace does. You're not saved by grace through faith in Christ alone so that now you got hand on base and can live however you choose to live. For neither circumcision or uncircumcision count for anything but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? There it is again. He did it twice. Now truth is one of those loaded words in Greek. It's the Greek word Aletheia. We like that word around here. But Paul's drawing our attention to something other than just propositional statements of fact. Like, oh, if you're, then, the, you know, A, B, C, D, we believe these things, you've got to obey these things. No, no, no. Remember, Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus himself said this that if you love me, keep my commandments. This is how the world will know you're my disciples, if you obey my commandments. If we're his, I'm talking to you men and women of God who've made that soul transaction, who've trusted in Jesus by grace through faith alone. If that's who you are, then you are now set free to love and obey him. We're serious about that around here. Jesus said, if you're going to call yourself a follower of me, then obey my voice. My sheep hear my voice and they obey it. They follow it. They do what I say. Who hindered you? You started off well. You started off trusting in Christ. You started off doing as he said once you've been rescued by grace out of joy and an overflow of thankfulness. You obeyed. What happened? He says to the Galatians. And I would ask you this morning... What's hindering you? The, the image, the word picture here is that of runners. And they're running, and then another runner kind of comes into the other runner's lane and cuts him off and keeps him from running well. I'm curious, what's cutting into your lane this morning, men and women of God? I'm a Christian. I go to Aletheia. Great. We're glad you're here. But I'm curious. If we candid camera you, We looked at your bank account, looked at your internet browser, listened to the words you say, looked at the company you keep, look at how you live your life. Would anyone be able to tell? We're running out of seats in here today. This is kind of one of those topics that will help us clear out a few. We are saved by grace through faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It is never alone. All of a sudden, we begin to care about what our master says. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden we come up out of the baptismal waters glowing, oh, never struggling, floating back to our seat, you know, 
eating nothing but Christian food, listening to nothing but really lame Christian music. I'm so glad we don't have one of those radio stations here, by the way. I grew up in a town with a really lame Christian radio station, and I'm glad that one doesn't exist here. Um, I'd like a good one, but I've never seen one yet. So when one happens, uh, we'll... That's, hey, there could be one. I'm open to the possibility of it existing in much the same way I am open to the tooth fairy existing. Um, just an excursus. As a guy who studied music, there's no such thing as Christian music, okay? There's music. God owns everything, okay? Just throwing that out there for you, my Berkeley students, amening me, okay? There's no such thing... There's no such thing as Christian music. There's music. Music doesn't get saved. Music doesn't have faith in Christ, okay? There's music with Christian lyrics that we sing here in in church on Sunday, but the idea is that that, that it, you know, okay, I'm I'm done. Excursus over. I'm going to just pull back on. I was in the weeds, pulling back on the road. Keep you people here for days. If I do that again, then there's there's an elder that comes and puts his hand on me, and then there's this crook that comes out, and you'll see something like, we're having technical difficulties, and then all of a sudden Donnie will be on stage, and everyone will go, what happened? That's how you know. I'll be hogtied behind the stage with duct tape over my mouth. Um, That that is the plan, if that happens, I think. We have it in the manual. Okay, moving on. Gosh, i got to focus. What's going on here? Who hindered you? Who kept you from obeying the truth? The idea is that truth is Jesus. If you've been set free by Jesus and your life is now owned by Jesus and your life finds its life in Jesus and Jesus is your master, then follow him into the freedom that he has won for you. You would be like the prisoner who walks out after 25 years and goes, oh, I don't, I don't know how to live there. You back up to the wall because you like the feeling of cold stone. When there is a freedom, there is an openness, there is a glory, there is a brightness, there is a joy to be lived, to be pursued in the person of God, if you would be set free today to pursue it, to love and obey him. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Here's the thing. We don't live in a particularly agrarian society, so I doubt this morning any of you woke up and made bread before you got here. Now, I realize we're in Cambridge, so there are some of you who sit around in drum circles and, you know, drink your fairly traded tea and talk about, you know, the latest kind of hairstyles for hemp or something. But uh, there are a few of you. Maybe you made your bread, but for the rest of us, they're not. We didn't make bread this morning, okay? And now, we own a bread machine, and we've, we've made bread before, and so you put the stuff in there, you know, the, the flour and the water and all that, and, all, and then it comes time to add the leaven, the yeast, and you add like this much, just a very small amount. You pop it in, and then nothing happens. Like, wow, okay, why did we add that? And then you walk away for about four hours. And then you come back, and it's huge. This small ball of dough has gone precisely what false teaching does. False teaching never comes in parading up on stage Sunday morning. Hi, ready for some false teaching? Here we go. Open your Book of Mormon to the first chapter, of, and, then, and then we move on from there. That's not how it works, okay? The false teaching comes in with one bad idea, just kind of easing up, and it festers. And your elders and your pastors just ignore it. You just don't do anything about it. And you don't keep a watchful eye over your spirit. You don't look, you don't do what Timothy says that says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. You don't do that. You just go, well, you know, it's just a little bit. And you begin to live with that leaven. And sure enough, a couple of years later, now the whole church starts to look, smell, and act completely other than what you remember Jesus looking and acting like. It's how false teaching works. It comes in. It alters the gospel. You walk away from it, and it's blown everything up how it works in your life. He says this, I have confidence in the Lord that you'll take no other view than mine and that the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted by these people? What Paul is saying is, look, you know this is not what I told you. If this is what I told you, why are these people trying to kill me? He's looking at him and saying, look, guys, let's just remember, I was there with you, and now they're coming in, and they're saying all sorts of bad. If if this is what I had taught you, if going back into the prison of legalism and religion, if if being released to do whatever the heck you want to do, if the two ditches of legalism and license were what I told you the gospel was, why are these people trying to destroy me? And then... Paul gets rather excited, and he says, you know, I tell you what, I got some ideas for these people who are getting really excited about circumcision. I kind of wish they would go all the way and just emasculate themselves so that they couldn't bear any more spiritual children that are bringing you down into bondage. 
that would be another, you know, if I start saying stuff like that, you know, again, see aforementioned hog tying, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't like that. Wow, P- Paul, ugh. I mean, let's just be clear what Paul just said. His hope was that the false teachers would emasculate themselves. All right, I don't have a graphic for that. If you're having trouble, just ask your neighbor, okay? It would emasculate themselves. And we hear that, and in our culture, we go, ooh, ooh. But that's very much because American Christianity has become, to a large extent, a cult of agreeability. Where, you know, Christians are kind of nice people. And we ought to be nice. And we kind of go, oh, hi, brother. Hey, how you doing? You know, everyone's calm. NPR voice. Hi. Yeah, nice guys. Ned Flanders. Sweater vest. Iron shirts. You know what I mean? Um nice. Everyone okay? Good. All right. Amen. The Lord be with you, brother. There's lots of brother for some reason. And we kind of, we, we live in this Christian cult of agreeability. And, and what you need to understand is that there's actually some things that God hates. There's actually some stuff God hates. God is love. Brothers, we know this, that God is love. And in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is love. The scriptures say it. But wrath is a function of love. God loves you. Therefore, he is determinedly opposed to what will kill you. I love my wife with all of my heart. If something was coming up in her life that was going to kill her, you know what? If I really love her, I hate that thing. I hate that thing. And if one of you are responsible for bringing it into her life, then guess what? You're on my caca list, okay? I'm not real excited about you either. All right? And guess what? That's okay. It is okay. It is okay to be opposed to that which opposes God because God loves you. If God loves you, then he opposes the things that are going to come in your life and kill you. But we don't see it like that. Oh, well, it's not, you know, they're just different. That's just, di- well, be careful. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It is not wrong to be angry. It is not wrong to be opposed to that which opposes God. It is wrong to sin. It is wrong to not also love but what you must understand is to begin to open yourself to the idea that love and wrath, two sides to very much the same coin. Think about people you love. They make you mad. <laughs> you don't get mad about that guy on the street like, oh, hello, fellow. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. It's, it's, always the, it's, always, it's always the girlfriend who won't call you or the boyfriend who won't call It's usually the boyfriend who won't call you, if we're honest. Isn't that how it works? I think that's how it's supposed to go. Um, he won't call me. Calm down. It's because he's stupid. Just give him some time. Make sure he's in a community group. We'll help him out. That's what we're here for. Um, part of the reason. Okay, back in the weeds again. Let's get back on, on message. A lot of you ladies were going, amen. Amen. Yeah. Get some of those women or get some of those men into those community groups and give them the left hand of fellowship and help them be husband worthy. We're working on it, okay? We're working on it. It's just something. It's on the list, but we love you. Just patience. Men under construction, okay? Patience. I got so much editing to do with this podcast, Pastor Donnie. It's not even funny. <laughs> this thing's going to be 18 minutes by the time I'm done, okay? Just bloop, and then, oh, is that it? Shortest sermon ever. Okay. Paul says this. We're not only free to love and obey God. We're free to love and serve each other. Remember, he's contrasting free from and free to. Now we've been made free to love and obey God rightly. Not love and obey God as though legalism were right, and now or love and obey God as though, you know, license to do whatever the heck you want to do is right. No, no, no. Love and obey God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. And the function of that is loving each other and serving each other. What is the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like that. You will love your neighbor as yourself. We've been set free. Do you understand the transaction that happens in the heart of the follower of Jesus is such that you have now been empowered and spirited and set free to actually love God and actually love people. And if we would actually believe that, then maybe we would actually begin to see some change around here. We've been set free to do that. 
If God has loved me past all my issues, then you know what? No matter how annoying or what your little issue is against me, I can love you. Because guess what? My offense against God, probably greater than whatever you could do to me. Therefore, I can love and serve you. You have no reason to be offended, no reason to bear uh, bitterness, no reason to get upset at others and carry that around with you if you've been forgiven, if you've been set free. Because your offense to God, that God has forgiven in you, is far greater, my friend, than anything anyone has ever done to you. And yeah, I really mean anything. The cross of Christ and the grace of Christ is so efficacious that it sets you free, not just from, but to love and obey God and love and serve each other. You were called the freedom brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are free to love and serve each other. It's ironic that those who wanted to obey God's laws alone couldn't. What does that produce? When we step back into prison, the prison of legalism and the prison of religion, what's it produce?